Why are you? What did I just do here? Just turned off half of my electronics. You're making fun of me. Well, I'm not making fun of you. I was just simply saying I turned off half of my electronics. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Glad you're here. Thanks for hanging out with us tonight on a fine Wednesday evening with a little bit of chill in the air. Yeah, it feels like fall. It's it looks funny like fall. Because for people who are coming here for Aquashella, more on that in a few minutes, uh, from around the country, it was 70 something degrees today. And now, Tomorrow, it's supposed to be a high of 55. So the weather is changing to Chicago fall just for you. So if you're coming from someplace hot and you're tired of it, <laughs> you're in good shape. This is going to be, well, yes, it's hoodie weather. That's for sure. Sweater that, weather. That's sweat. Have you seen all the memes and stuff? I have not. I've it's just really seen a annoying. bunch of memes about soup, about how everybody's eating soup now around here because oh, it's getting I switch. chilly. I frequently switch. Did you switch to soup already? I, I make the switch from salads to soups. No soup for you. So anyway, yeah, uh, Alice loved the new shirts. Well, we got actually not one, but two new shirts we're, we're repping, kicking today. Uh, this is the one we introduced, was it last week? The Just Scape It one that's on the website. Uh, thank you, by the way, for everybody who put orders in for that. That was pretty cool. Yeah. So we have these. And then tell us a story about what you're wearing, because at first okay. glance, it doesn't seem it's, overly like... It's just, a, it's just a white logo, a single logo of primetime, but it glows. Many requests. Specifically, let's see if Bunny Viper's here. Bunny Viper. Yeah. Glow. You need to let me know what size you are. Make sure we have one on hand, because the thing is that I ordered them specifically for Aquashella because they're very glowy. You know, there's a lot of glow things that they have. So we'll bring them there first. They're not on the website yet, but then after Aquashella, we'll post them on the website. Yep. So it's an Aquashella very limited run special glow in the dark. When she first got them, she's in the bathroom downstairs with the light off yeah. and I'm walking, I'm going outside and I hear, look, <laughs> half scared me to death because mm -hmm. I wasn't expecting her to be there in Somebody the dark. Creeping in there. Yeah. And then I look, I'm like, and the other part that scared me is I see Primetime Aquatics just glowing in the dark. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's pretty cool. So we'll bring those, like we said, we'll bring those to Aquashella. They're not going to be on the website until potentially after Aquashella if we have any left. Because we didn't, we didn't get a ton of them, right? No, I actually placed a pretty small order. Yeah. Um, medium, okay. So, right. yeah, that's what's going on there. So, anyway, uh, things that have happened in the land of videos this week so far... I'm totally messed up with this new schedule. I was almost going to talk about Monday's video. It's not Monday's video anymore. It was Sunday's video. Uh, I did a species profile. Did you happen to see it? Ooh. With that look, we already know the answer, don't we? Um, well, I, I, it usually takes me a long time to figure out the video that I did, so then it's even back one further uh, for Sunday. Yeah. Uh, give me a hint. Gold Tetra. Yes. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so, because yeah. I love the Gold Tetra. If you haven't seen the video, you, it's worth checking out because a lot of people just think, oh, Gold Tetra, okay, whatever. But what's really cool about the Gold Tetra is, one, it, it, it's a little bit more gold when it's young. And then as they grow up, they get a silver color. Part of that has to do with this, this antimicrobial, antiprotozoal uh, coating that they secrete, which gives them a gold sheen. And they lose that, especially so if they're wild caught, uh, they lose that pretty fast because it's no longer necessary to produce. But even when they're older and they start to change that color into more of a silver, it's a really pretty fish. It's just, it's got, it's still got a little tiny bit of gold, but a mm. lot of silver and mm -hmm. very metallic, something very metallic to add to your fish tank. And they're about beautiful. the size of a neon tetra. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty cool. I so love that's them. what we did on Sunday. Today on the small scape, what did you do? What did you do? I did a little bit of to, uh, a little tour of all the tanks that were at the AGA convention this last weekend. There were a lot of uh, they had, they had so much to do for the people who signed up for their awesome I call it an adventure. They had a uh, road trip to the um, shed aquarium. They had workshops, both a nanoscaping and um, uh, wabikusa. And they had speakers and talks, and it was just, it was, it was really, really cool. Yeah, the AGA, we had never been to it before, the Aquatic no. Gardeners Association Convention, and it was a lot of fun. It, it's not a huge thing, right? So it's Small. not like an Aquashella. Uh, it would be comparable in, in some ways to, if you've ever been to the OCA, but maybe a little bit on the uh, smaller side, but the presentations were, I would consider them to be really high-end presentations. So if you like learning about fish and aquascaping and 
Uh, there was some nerdery going on there. I saw DNA sequences being talked about a couple of times. So if you're into that sort of thing, the AGA is definitely something to consider and it travels. So the AGA was here and it's going to be somewhere else in a couple of years. So if you get a chance, it's in your area, definitely recommend it. It was a lot of fun. Uh, so that was your video on Wednesday, today, today, and then tomorrow we've got members video coming out. And then this Sunday, I'm doing something that I hope will be helpful for grownups, for adults in fish keeping. That's well, all I'm going to say about it. Yes, it does. <laughs> so that will be will be this Sunday. And so that's kind of the, the thing going on. We did start doing uh, shorts. So for those of you who have been paying attention to the channel, we started putting those out. But I've been trying to do them in a way that I think will complement what Primetime Aquatics is all about. And I hope that you're, if you're seeing them, you're enjoying them. Uh, so it's basically little educational bits in a minute or less. Uh, turns out you can actually do quite a bit of, of education in a minute. So I, I kind of like that. So that is what's going on there. Really, it's like one a day. It's usually at noon. So if you haven't checked them out, it, it might be worth it uh, just to see what, what's <laughs> going on. It. it might be worth it. might not be. I don't know. Check it out if it's and, not and let them know if it's but, not worth it. But I also know for a lot of people, especially on YouTube, you know, sometimes the short little, the short shorts aren't, uh, aren't, everybody's, aren't everybody's jam. So, um, yeah. Mark, thank you for the super chat. Bunny will need one triple XL to hold her big Aww. heart. That was very nice. People saying nice things about people. Aww, I love it. Thank I you very much. It. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, so where we're going to be, uh, Aquashella, obviously, is this weekend. Aquashella, Chicago. Cannot wait. I, it's one of those things where the closer it gets, the more excited I get, the more like it sinks in. Wow, we, we're doing this. Uh, we will be there both days, Saturday and Sunday. We've actually got some work to do Friday for setting up. You've got some tanks to set up. I've, I've been, got yeah. to help with setting up the creator booth. Hopefully they'll have something for me to do because I'll tell you, Ed, Chattanooga, Ed, uh, Fish Room Fever, James is going to be there, Carrie. Carrie uh, and, and, and Jess. In, and Jess and... Mm -hmm. Um, th th they work. They really oh work. And sometimes like by the time I get there, balls. I'm like, um, can I do something? Because they just they just go, 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 go. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and we're looking forward to that. Jay Oliver, is he going to be there? He's uh, another one. And yeah, yeah, he, he Oof, definitely works man. hard. I, I, They're I crazy. don't remember. I, I'm fairly certain. So, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. By the way, I don't know... I don't know how it's communicated, but if you are a if you bought VIP tickets to Aquashella, they're doing and I love this. They're doing the same thing that they did in Dallas, and that is Friday evening from six to eight. I believe it's at the hotel, like in the restaurant at the hotel. They are doing a special kind of more intimate VIP meet and greet where it's there's going to be some light snacky food served and some non-alcoholic beverages and we just get to kind of hang out with people it was a lot of fun it was a lot of fun in dallas because we just got an opportunity to hang out sit around at a table and eat some food and and just kind of talk for a couple hours so if you've got yeah. vip tickets that's friday night from 6 to 8 p.m at the hotel for aquashella so that's just an added uh, added benefit uh, on top of that, obviously, you get the meet and greets on Saturday and Sunday. You get in a little bit earlier, at least an hour earlier than the early bird people. So that's pretty cool. I believe there is like a $20 or $30 merch um, like coupon that you get so you can pick out a shirt. And yeah, a lot of cool things there. I will be speaking. I mentioned this last week. I believe it is at noon, right? Is that what we said last week? Noon on Sunday. I will be talking about kind of like a beginner's guide to Lake Tanganyika and cichlids if you're interested in keeping those fish. I will be talking about them in a way, hopefully, especially for new people that will encourage them to try to keep such an awesome group of fish. So that is what is going on there. Also, as an added benefit, especially if you're going to be in the area and you're not leaving Sunday or you're local, the Greater Chicago Cichlid Association, GCCA, you can find more information at gcca.net, they're going to be holding their regular monthly meeting. Do you know who's speaking at that meeting? No. Dean. You know, Dean hangs out with Corey. That oh, Dean. Oh, really? Yeah, he's coming out and he's going to be speaking at the GCCA wow. on Sunday evening. Now, I don't know if we'll be able to get there because there's so much going on with the Aquashella. But if you're in the area, there's no cost to go to a meeting. So even if you're just stopping in for the weekend, there'll probably be, uh, I mean, I know there will be fish auctions afterwards that fish sometimes go for not very much money. So if you're going to be around Sunday evening, now it's not at the 
at the hotel where Aquashella is at the convention center. It's up in Northbrook. But if you go to gcca.net and you want to see Dean talk, I mean, he's he's pretty good uh, presenter. It's free. Go there. Check it out. If you're in the area, it's, it's definitely worth it. So that's what's happening there. Uh, we do have a couple swaps coming up on the 16th. We've got Greenwater, 16th of this month. And on the 30th, we have the GCCA swap. So we'll be at both. Fish will have on the website for pre-order. If you're going to the swap, you want fish from us. I, I say this all the time. Trust me, just pre-order the fish because every single swap we go to, there's at least a half a dozen people are like, oh, aren't you bringing these? Yep, but they sold out in five minutes. And so it's always better if you can pre-order, you know the stuff is going to be there. So that's why we do it. So you don't show up for fish and then realize, oh, somebody bought them right in front of you. That's happened too. There you always get the yep. the person who's holding the fish, and then like there's two or three other down. people just kind of like the minute they set down, <laughs> shoop, somebody, yeah, I'll take these. Uh, your hand, you know, they're handing you money, so pre-order yeah. sells all of that. Not good. And then uh, next month we've got the OCA, the Ohio Cichlid Association Extravaganza, that is in Strongsville, Ohio. It's been there for decades. It's an awesome thing. It's kind of like imagine a fish flea market in a hotel. People are selling fish out of their rooms, small vendor room, lots of presentations a really cool cichlid show bowl show thing so lots of fish to see not only just cichlids but also scavengers we will be there uh probably the best time to meet or hang out with us would be friday evening and saturday because on sunday it's all about the the auction so they have a swap on sunday like sunday early late after it was late morning early afternoon and then after that they have the auction so at that point, the area that we're normally hanging out in has been, you know, commandeered for the other things going on at the OCA. If we're doing that, I am 95% sure we will be bringing fish to the OCA. So if you're in the area and can't make it to some of the local stuff, we'll do the same thing, pre-orders. And so I think that's the way we're going to roll with that. Kevin and Lisa, thank you so much for the super chat. I got my Oscar online from the Cichlid Shack. Great experience. Loved your real versus fake plants video because he shreds them all. <sighs> Had to go fake route. Yeah, Oscars just do that. So there's nothing wrong with using some plasticky plants or whatever they're making them out of these days for your Oscars or your Vieja or your Midas Cichlids or Red Devils or Dovi. Well, I suppose a Dovi would just shred those things too just because they wanted to. But yeah, that's really cool. Thank you. Let's see. Whip. What's up? Thanks for the super chat, Jason. Can we pick up our creator badges on Friday? Yes, you should be able to because uh, creators, there's the front desk. So usually that door is, you know, the door to the front desk is open because there's people there handing those things out. So yeah, that's usually how we roll with it. So absolutely. That is Sweet. a definite thing. Yeah, and if not, ask the guy that's sitting out front. Well, the guy sitting out front will be the same guy from AGA. Yes. Yeah, so he's always there. You should uh, up front. I was going to say something. I don't remember. But anyway, today we do have a topic. And you didn't even know what the topic was, did you? Yeah, where to buy fish. Where to buy fish. Where to buy fish. So the reason I wanted to talk about this is, again, we're. I know it sounds so weird. We're, we're entering fish season. Fish season is kind of like, it's sort of like football season timeline add on a few couple months of basketball season you know or hockey season on the back end of that so uh, we're entering fish season and a lot more people start getting interested in in fish and it's getting a little cooler outside in a large part of the world so people are like you know what i'd really like to uh maybe add some fish to my tanks or add another tank or something like that and i wanted to talk a little bit about where we can buy some fish interesting i don't know did you see the poll that i put out yesterday um, I don't think so. I don't think I looked a whole lot on YouTube so yesterday. So I, I put out a poll, and basically I asked people where do they buy the majority, or where do they buy most of their fish? Oh. So the options were, like your Petco's and PetSmart's, local fish stores, right? Those small mom-and-pop-owned sorts of places. Yeah. Swaps, mm -hmm. slash, you know, swap-type clubs, and... Online? And online. Okay. Now, I, I don't think I was expecting what the results actually look like. And there was like 45 or 4,600 votes. So it was a pretty big sample size. Okay, so the majority went to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess here, the majority went to um, small stores. Yeah, so 
Really? The, yeah. The local fish stores, they got, and I, I thought this was great. So local fish stores got 66% of the vote. So almost wow. two thirds of you are supporting your local fish store. And I think that's awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, there was like 19 or 20% that were buying their fish from Petco and PetSmart. A lot of them in the comments section said, hey, this is pretty much my only option. So yeah. I have to do what I have to do, which that's cool. 12% uh, were online and only 2% buy their fish from fish swaps. Probably because not a lot of areas have fish swaps. Well, that's true in terms of, you know, square mileage, but the big, like the big markets mostly do. So I was surprised by that, but nevertheless, nonetheless, it was, it was pretty interesting. And so I wanted to take a few minutes and, and kind of talk about these, these options that we have, and maybe you will consider other options too, as you, as you think about your fish keeping hobby. So first thing, local fish store is awesome. And I'm, I'm really happy to hear that a lot of you are able to support your local fish store because they are such an important part of this hobby. It's one of the reasons why when we go out and we do our traveling, we try to, as best we can, if there's a local fish store out there that we stop in and they're doing things the right way, we'd like to bring them a little bit of exposure and a little bit of recognition because local fish stores, I think for the most part, they're trying to do the right thing. I think uh, you know, sometimes you get the local fish stores that are maybe a little bit old school and maybe they haven't adapted or maybe their customer service isn't always the best selection, you know, sometimes can be wanting. But a lot of the local fish stores are doing a pretty good job. They, You walk in, they've got something there for everybody from the beginner to the more experienced fish keeper. They are, I think one of the important things when it comes to a local fish store is a lot of the employees and certainly the owners. These are people who really like fish. Let's face it. If you want to work at a fish store, chances are you're interested in fish, right? It's where if you're doing a Petco PetSmart thing, you might just have somebody who decided to work at Petco or PetSmart. It's close. They may like animals and then all of a sudden they get stuck in the live fish department. They're like, okay, well, I'll make this work. But maybe they don't always have all of the experience and uh, advice that you would like, right? So it could be very, very different depending on the the store that you that you go to for both cases but i think it's it's not only do you get people who are hopefully really into the hobby but these are also people when you go there enough and you go there at the right times you can start to form relationships with the employees and maybe even with the owner and that can bring added benefits like hey you know what i'm really looking for this specific fish can you find it and sometimes the the owners of these local fish stores will be like hey you know what let me check things out I'll get back to you, give me your number, and if I can find them, I'll try to bring them in, right? And so that can be an added benefit where they can bring fish in with their normal shipments and, and sometimes you don't have to order them online, right? And then pay all the shipping costs and everything. What, do, is there anything you particularly like about the local fish store or don't like? Well, I like smaller stores in general. So just kind of like the atmosphere of a smaller mm -hmm. store and the fact that you know generally speaking the people that are behind the counters they just have a lot more passion for it and their answers are you can just tell right off the bat their answers uh when you have any kind of questions so yeah you know and the other thing to consider too when it comes to your local fish store is pricing so prices can be all over the place we've got some stores around us where the prices are quite frankly insane they are marked up and it's bit. not all fish so and some of like the what I would call the lost leader fish, some of the beginner, smaller fish, they're actually fairly competitive. But when you get into some of the, the fish that aren't quite as common, the prices are astronomical. And so you really do have to pay attention at your local fish store. And it's going to be highly dependent upon who's running it and what their overhead is. But a lot of times in terms of price, it can be, it can be all over the place. I would say for the really, really super common fish, if you're comparing them to like a PetSmart or Petco, sometimes they're gonna have to be a little bit more expensive, right? Sometimes, because these local stores aren't necessarily relying on their fish department to just kind of be a, you know, off on the corner somewhere and if they make money on it, then eh, whatever. If they lose money, that's fine too because they've got so many other things that they're selling that aren't even related to fish like a Petco or PetSmart where the price of the fish isn't gonna completely, you know, ruin their business model where with a local fish store they have to make sure that they're selling fish and can still pay for all the overhead all right so uh you, you do have to do your homework when you're when you're purchasing fish don't be afraid to shop around and see 
not only price, but more importantly, health, right? What are the stores doing to try and ensure that you're getting healthy fish? Are they quarantining? Are they bringing fish in and then immediately just turn them right back out again? Are they treating tanks that look unhealthy? There have been some times where we've walked into some fish stores and it's very obvious to me that they've got a number of tanks where fish are sick and those tanks, the lights are still on and are still selling fish out of those tanks. More importantly, for people who don't have a discerning eye, when they're buying those fish, now you've got employees putting the nets in there, and then, oh, you want this fish? Then I go over to this tank with that same nasty net that's got, you know, that where there was fish covered in ick, and now they're swiping fish out of the next tank. Not good. So you do have to pay attention. Uh, there are times when I've walked into fish stores, and I don't buy anything the first time around. I just spend a lot of time looking around. And then I maybe come back in a week or two, and there's something there that I might want. But, yeah, so... That can be, um, like I said, you just have to pay attention to the actual store. Petco's Pet Smarts, anything you particularly like about them? I know we've got them both within, what, a couple miles of our house. Well, for me personally, it's the selection they usually have of substrate. My favorite substrate comes from Pet Smart. And, um, and for if you really need plants, kind of short notice, I think they both have uh, a very decent selection, especially of the two plants and even sometimes the little tissue cultures. One of my favorite plants that I always get whenever I see it is the Anubius gold coin in the tissue culture. I just never turn it down. They're just, it's such a beautiful little plant. Yeah. Not a lot of money. You know, and that's something to consider too. And I know some of you, you don't have a choice. And I don't like the fact that for people who don't have a choice, they, they sometimes have to feel bad. Like, oh, I gotta, I, I'm less of a fish keeper because I buy my fish at PetSmart or Petco. No, you're not. Mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of people, that's what's in the area. And they still serve an important role in fish keeping. And that is, while yes, there can be challenges, and we've all seen videos of, oh my gosh, this just happened at one of the big box stores. For some people, that's all they have. Uh, realistically in terms of if they want to go to a store, pick something out. Now, obviously with, with the big box stores like a Petco or PetSmart, you're going to be limited in terms of the fish that you can buy. It's very rare that I've walked into one of those stores and been like, holy cow, this is different. However, there are some PetSmarts I've walked into where I'm like, ooh, yeah, they do have some some cool stuff here. Not necessarily like mind-blowingly rare, <laughs> but certainly a better, like it just really depends on the store. I mean, we've got yeah. a few and there's one that is what, maybe 15 miles away that we've gone to from time to time. And all of a sudden it's like, you know what? This is This particular store has twice the number of tanks that the one closest to us has. And they're filling those tanks with fish that are actually pretty cool. Uh, prices for what they're selling, listen, they're buying in massive quantities. They should be able to, because of that, sell fish, at least price-wise, for less than most other people, right? The, the downside sometimes is, again, you don't always have the most knowledgeable people working there, but that can vary wildly. Uh, I've walked into some Petco's and PetSmart's where I felt really good about, you know, just, I, I listen. Um, you know, when they're telling people, hey, you know, what kind of fish do you have? What kind of tank do you have? Uh, you know, here's the deal with these fish where you can tell they've been around fish, but that's not always the case. Sometimes you've got someone where it might be their first job or their second job. And like I said, they just wind up in the fish keeping department and maybe they've got a fish tank, but it's really hard to give people advice about fish if you've never kept them before. Like you can read something about them, but like, well, this is semi-aggressive and don't keep it in a community tank and it's the size tank they need. But beyond that, it's hard to provide advice to people if you haven't kept the fish. And so that can sometimes be a downside, right? So you got the selection issues. But again, if you if you have to go there, I please don't feel, I, I get kind of tired of that where it's, you know, it's just constantly being bashed and we're not sponsored by them in any way, shape or form. And sometimes it's, it's, deserved. I mean, sometimes you look at what they're doing, it's like, wow, you know, you guys need to fix some things here. But again, it, it is dependent upon the manager. Um, yeah. One thing that you hit on, and I think it's true, is one of the nice things is you can go into a Petco or PetSmart. And I just heard someone was saying that the, the fish tank sales going on at Petco, people ask us all the time, hey, where do you get your, your fish tanks? I don't have some great, wonderful super high quality special you know fish manufacturing facility that i deal with the overwhelming majority of the tanks that we have what because otherwise i would have a whole lot more tanks yeah uh <laughs> <laughs> putting me i need another one the 
<laughs> almost all of them have come from like the pet code dollar per gallon sales or not, I guess now they're not really dollar per gallon. They're, you know, 50% off or whatever sales they're doing uh, of the standard sizes, the tens, the twenties of all different shapes and sizes, 40 breeders, even the 75 gallons. Our larger tanks have come from a mostly kind of local chain store, like the 125s, the 150 came from PetSmart. They held up just fine. Uh, I've only had out of all the tanks that we've bought one leak. Now, obviously, if you do something like a custom aquariums, you're going to get a much, much better tank, but it's going to cost you a lot more too. So you get that aspect too, where usually they're pretty competitive on their tanks and sometimes competitive on like their filters, heaters, convenient. Now, take a sip of my water here. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Thank you very much. Uh, let's see here. Hold on. I want to address a couple things because the chat all went crazy on me and started jumping around so let me scroll up scroll down and there we are come on come on come on come on uh mary page thank you for being here for the mary last page. two years hey everybody i'm working and lurking <laughs> that sounds pretty cool sounds thanks productive. for being here for the last 24 months that's pretty darn awesome it's like two and years there's a cool sticker she followed up with Thank you. Aww. Mary Page, someday you're going to have to get out to one of these aquashellas. That's just oh my the way gosh. it needs to be. That, so yeah. That would be really cool. We need cool. to arrange that somehow. I hope so. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeremy, appreciate the super chat. I just got a 90-gallon fish tank for free. Oh, That's sweet. Score. And it came with two blood parrots and a clown loach. How many in a tank for African cichlids do you recommend? it? I wouldn't put African cichlids in with those blood parrots. I would get rid of them first. And the reason for that is they have no ability to defend themselves if the African cichlids start to go after them, and they probably will. So full-grown, whether it's peacocks and Buna cichlids, they, and I would, I would, if it were me, if I'm doing a 90-gallon, I'm probably going in Buna. And those can be, especially when they get larger, they can be downright aggressive in some cases. And what, and once they realize those blood parrots, because of their mouth structure, they really can't bite down, they can't defend themselves, they're going to be in big trouble. Clown loach is actually fine. You probably want to add another three or four, but I've kept them with all kinds of cichlids without any issues. So if you're going to go that route in the 90, which is a great tank, by the way, and I really think you would enjoy a, an Imbuna tank. I, the only reason why I wouldn't go peacock cichlids, you can do it. I've done it in a 75 gallon. I tend to think and maybe some of you will disagree, or maybe some of you agree who've kept these fish. When they get older, if you do an all-male peacock cichlid tank, they're actually more aggressive to me than the Imbuna are. Uh, Imbuna just seem to figure things out as long as you don't get any of the real, real nasty ones. Uh, I would stay away from uh, the Demasonii, the Bumblebees, Aratus, and that entire genus uh, that the Aratus belongs to, uh, Melanochromus, and probably go with things like Yellow Labs, Red Zebras, uh, the Solosi, Rusty Cichlids, just having that combination, Pseudotropius ACI and a 90 would look really good. If you had that combo, for the most part, they're going to get along fairly well, and you're going to get orange, you're going to get yellow, you're going to get blue. The Rusties, especially if you put them on a lighter substrate, they have like a purplish color. So that would be pretty cool. And in a 90, you could easily, adult size, you could have 25 African Cichlids in there without any problems. So that'd be cool, but just I, get rid of the blood. If you want to keep the blood parrots, I wouldn't put African cichlids in there. I just think it will be long-term, could be a potential issue. Jeremy, thank you so much for becoming a prime timer. Really appreciate you being here. Hope you enjoy the experience. <laughs> Bonsai Science, same with you. Glad you're here. We'll have a video out for you tomorrow. Same with Shogun. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. Cool. So that'll be cool. Glad you are here. Thank you. Fish fan. Fish fan 20 gallon long. You're here. That's awesome. Thanks for being here. Uh, Daryl says, hello. <laughs> I found baby shrimp have been born in one of my five gallon aquariums. It's a first again for me. Do nearite snails eat uh, blackbeard algae? Thank you. So first of all, congratulations on your baby shrimp. That's exciting. I don't Cute. care how long you've been keeping fish. I still get excited about guppies, platies, mollies, baby shrimp, baby mystery snails, yep. you name it. That's I get stuff. excited about it. I, I don't think that will ever end for me because I've bred, I, even the Maltese, I've bred thousands of Maltese. But every time I see the little babies hang out by a shell, I have to stop and be like, oh, that's really cool. Guppies too. I don't know how many thousands of guppies have bred in our fish room, but it's so always fun. excited. So congratulations. 
Will Nereid snails eat the black beard algae? I haven't seen him do it. So the only thing that I know for a fact that eats black beard algae is the, and it's not appropriate for a small five gallon tank, you need a larger tank, is the Siamese algae eater. Well, sometimes eat it. And we've had mystery snails eat it, but that was our mystery snail breeding tank where it was a 20 gallon long that had probably 150 mystery snails. And so you'd throw in like a piece of Anubius or something that was covered in black beard algae and they would polish that stuff off. But other than that, I... There's not a lot that really eats it. I just, I control it by controlling nitrate levels, 20 parts per million or less, making sure my lights aren't on too long and uh, making sure it's not, yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm not using liquid fertilizers and then causing all this algae issue. And as long as the plants are growing, I'm not adding the fertilizer. Andy, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Number one. Hey, hey Andy. You're going to be at Aquashella this weekend? Yeah, are you? I thought you said you were, but maybe I misremembered. Gotta be. I could have misremembered. Uh, so, okay, moving on back to our thing. The online part was interesting, 12% of people. That's actually up. Uh, there's a lot more people ordering fish online now than there used to be, certainly even four or five years ago. Seasonal that was That was a very rare, rare occurrence. And I think as people, if you haven't done it before, as you know, the, the concern is, oh my gosh, I'm ordering these fish. They're going to ship from some facility. They're going to show up at my door. How are they going to survive that? Let me put your mind at ease. Let me explain something real quick how fish keeping generally works uh, in the aquarium industry. A lot of fish, many of the fish that you buy at a pet store actually originate overseas. All right, so maybe they're in Taiwan, Indonesia, Brazil, Malaysia. They're, they're all over the place. Those fish then get shipped into the United States and they wind up at a wholesaler. So they're already in a box for you know a day or two. And they go from wholesaler to pet store, and then from pet store to your tank. And all the while, they're traveling. So when you buy fish online, some of that still may occur. You might still be going from overseas to your online retailer, or from overseas to wholesaler to online retailer. Maybe your online retailer is just breeding the fish and skips all of that travel. So when it's going from the place that you're buying to your home, it's usually a day. Lot, that, that's how a lot of the fish in the industry gets shipped anyway. My recommendation, if you're going to be buying fish online, always do the overnight shipping, right? That's just, you don't want fish in a box if you can avoid it for two or three days. Do the overnight. A lot of online retailers have kind of just basically pushed that way anyway and don't give customers the option. And at first, I think a lot of people thought, boy, you know what? This, this is just you know too expensive to ship. Maybe, but it's a lot more expensive to ship and get your fish in two or three days and then have something happen and wind up with your shipment not going so well. So both the the shippers, the sellers, and I think the people who are receiving the fish, the buyers are better off just doing overnight shipping. Uh, the downside, of course, is you gotta be there, right? So you need to be present when the fish deliver, usually, right? You have to sign for them. Not always, but the vast majority of the time, that's what's required. So if you are working full time and the ship, the fish are going to you know, deliver someday, on, sometime on Tuesday, well, you're going to have to be there. Uh, the other cool thing, I think, is variety, right? If you think about all the online retailers, you can pretty much find the fish you're looking for. You know, I mean, uh, Flip Aquatics, channel sponsor, they've got all the nano fish covered. They've got all the shrimp. They've been doing it for a long time. You, you know, think about KG Tropicals and all the bettas that they have. There are some really good places that's, and that basically specialize in African cichlids and South American cichlids. And so you can buy fish from these places that specialize. And to keep the cost down, ask them, hey, how many, f to maximize my, you know, to minimize the shipping cost, wh what do I need to fill a box, right? Because that's ideally what you want to do. You want to fill a box. And make sure those bags, to the best of your ability, are maxed out. So, yeah, maybe it's not the most efficient thing to just buy one little tiny bag of fish. Maybe it's something where it's like, oh, I've got a tank and I want to make a slightly larger order to make the shipping work. Because the shipping is going to cost you some money, right? The nice thing about buying online sometimes is the price per fish might actually be less than what you're paying at a fish store. But then once you add in the shipping, it becomes comparable or slight, maybe even a little bit more. But again, to work around that, you just want to make sure that you're maximizing your shipping. What else? What else you, you want to say about buying fish online? Anything positive, negative? 
Well, seasonal, right? Mm -hmm. Very good point. Yes. Uh, we. <laughs> it's kind of interesting because spring and fall, for the most part, in most of the United States, it's the easiest time to ship fish because the temperatures don't get too high. They don't get too low. And so sometimes it can, it can well, sometimes it can be easier. Early summer often is a very easy time because, again, t uh, temperatures are stable. But once temperatures get really cold in the winter, it becomes a little bit harder. You really want to make sure that when you are buying fish from an online retailer that they have got some experience and that they're reputable, that they know what they're doing, that they're checking out, okay, here's the weather where I'm at. Here's the weather where the fish are going. Are they going to need heat packs? Are, gonna, are they going to need ice packs? Are, how are we going to temperature control this thing? Because that's the number one thing when it comes to fish not surviving is they get way too hot or way too cold and then you wind up with some losses so you know and then dealing with those losses again you want a reputable seller uh, company because when the fish show up if you've got some that have been lost you want to make sure that they are experienced and okay what are we going to do about this am i going to ship you new fish am i going to just give you a credit for your next order uh, usually be very careful with this if you ever order online and you've got dead fish most online retailers are going to require you to show the fish in the bag deceased. So take a picture, send it to them so that they know, okay, they showed up that way. And it's a lot easier to deal with as opposed to a day later be like, oh, by the way, I bought, you know, 10 fish from you and six of them were dead. And they're going to be like, okay, well, show me the fish in the bag. And I can't do that. It creates a problem. So uh, keep, just keep that in mind. Last one. Swaps. I'll let you start. This is your jam. Ooh, swaps are the best. That's where I get my hitter in your Formosa. There you go. <laughs> and Lucas said that he got from our videos, he saw the gold yeah. and he got them from Steve and they just had babies. That's cool. Little Florida Lease Kelly fish. Ooh, how exciting. If you have fish clubs in your area and go. they run swaps go even if they don't run swaps and they run monthly meetings most of the time those monthly meetings are going to include a little mini fish auction where the members bring in fish that they've bred maybe they're doing breeder awards points otherwise known as bap and often the fish go for a whole lot less than you could ever possibly find them at any of the other outlets that we've talked about so far I highly encourage all of you do research. Just type in fish clubs or fish, yeah, fish clubs near me or fish clubs near, and then put in your your town or the major town by where you live. It can absolutely be worth driving an hour. We get people at our swaps. They've come from you know we're in northern Illinois, Kentucky, Iowa, Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Wisconsin. I mean from all over, Missouri, all over the place. And they just make a day of it, all right? The swap is usually, people ask all the time, what's the swap? A swap is basically like a fish flea market. You're not actually trading fish, unless it's like vendors that sometimes will swap stuff. <laughs> but for people who go there, you're just buying fish. But you're buying them often, not always, but often they've bred the fish. So they've gone, they've just been in their tanks. Especially if it's local, the nice thing is the people who are bringing the fish, whether they've bred them, bought them, often they've already been in your water. So if like for us, Chicago water, that's really important for us. When we sell fish, they've been in our tanks for about four weeks already. So they're eating, they're healthy. If they had a problem, they've been medicated and recuperated. That sounds like a shirt. They've been medicated and recuperated. Uh, they've been in our water for four weeks. And so for people who are buying fish from us in the area and they've got similar water parameters, they know, okay, these fish have survived in water parameters that are similar to my own they're eating they've been eating healthy foods they've been watched like a hawk and oh and by the way at the swaps by far like i've already mentioned sort of you're gonna those are by far the best prices i mean it's, it's not even close it's not even close bud movie don't say it yeah come on not even close bud okay we'll we'll see who gets it because someone's gonna have to get that one if not we're going to be highly disappointed. You should do so your Jimmy Stewart impersonation. The, oh, come on. So plants, rocks, wood, fish of all different kinds, cichlids, non-cichlids, nanofish, you name it. Everything is usually there. Uh, lots of different types of swaps out there. Some of them are small. Our green water swap, there might be 40 or 50 vendors. GCCA, you can get upwards of 100. Some of them don't cost any money to get in. You almost, you never have to be a member. That's the other question that people ask is, oh, do I have to be a member of the club to go to the swap? No, 
Absolutely not. So a lot of them, like the Greenwater one, it's free. A GCC, it's like five bucks. So trust me, I promise you, spending five dollars and then going there and saving a ton of money, you're gonna save that five. You're gonna save that five bucks like instantly. We're getting a lot of guesses, but none of them are correct. I think right. I know, but I'm not gonna say. All right, so hold on. We'll, we'll do one more. Uh, Demented and sad, but social. You just gave it away. Well, I know, but I had to go easier because people were coming up with other answers that were probably pretty good based on the the, the voice that I used. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was that was awesome. Yeah. Uh, Breakfast Club, the Zen. Zen always gets it. He's like, boom. Hey, Zen. Zen you must watch a ton of movies a lot and remember yeah, them a lot. I think like she I, probably does. Yeah. You're like right there with me, and it's crazy. So anyway, those are some things to consider. If you if you can find a swap in your area, I would highly recommend. Check it out. I've never been to a bad one. That's all I have to say. <laughs> I've never been to one where I'm like, there's nothing here at all. I can always find something. Yeah, yeah. Bloodworms, pit member for 10 months. Thank you so much. How many in Buna and a 75? Thanks for all the awesome info and the over the last seven months. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, in Buna and a 75, I would say about 20 full grown. Low 20, somewhere in there, but uh, that again, those are more like the yellow lab size, red zebra. Uh, AC, I get a little big, so you got to be careful there. I don't know if I would do more than one just because they are a larger imbuna, rusty cichlid, pseudotropia solosi, uh, the sokolofi. But yeah, I would say, you know, and when you do that number, especially when they're smaller, it doesn't look like much, but when they get older, really cool. Oink Master. Thank you so much for the super chat. Any advice for Salvinia and Frogbit in tanks? I'll let you, I have no advice, so you, you, you advise. Any advice for it? Well, if you want it, you definitely want to keep it under control. That means like every couple days, just print it out. Don't, don't wait like seven days. Otherwise, it may cover, cover up your tank. But it's good if you want to uh, add some shade, maybe to plants below. If you want to use up some stuff, maybe you're getting some algae. They can definitely serve their purpose, and they look really pretty, too. Yeah. So, so there you go. if you have any other questions specifically to that that I didn't address, just throw it on in there. She said, I thought I had regular Salvinia at the auction. It was giant Salvinia. Oops. Giant? I've never had giant Salvinia. Oh, great. Thanks a lot. Only Salvinia Minima. Now we're going to have giant Salvinia all over the fish room. I've had giant duckweed. I blame you for that. It's not much better than regular duckweed. You're I'll in tell trouble. You yep. Oh, but I saw something I wanted to answer, and then the thingy. Oh, uh, Carl says, I wish I could go to Aquashella. I wish you could go, too. And then somebody said something about doing an Aquashella in Boston. Oh, I have often said that would be cool. it would be cool if Aquashella traveled, kind of like the ACA yeah. or um, the AGA, mm -hmm. which they do that in different places, or just add them. It, it can be a little tough. You know, three is actually a lot, but if it... I would love to see at least an opportunity for the whole western side of the United States out in, you know, the LA, Las Vegas, you've got Portland, you've got Seattle, you've got San Francisco, you know, San Diego, Phoenix. So all of those areas, I think it would be cool to to put an aqua shell out there. Again, it doesn't have to necessarily be like, oh, we're doing 10 aqua shells a year cuz I don't think there's uh, it would it would be a really tough go. Uh, definitely in the Boston area, somewhere up there, somewhere like really scenic and nice. We did the aquatic experience in New Jersey that one time, or a couple times actually. Uh, so yeah, going somewhere up that way. But I think it would be cool to to maybe have at least one location travel to a different place every year. Uh, maybe that'll. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm not privy to any of that information. But I just I I would I just think it'd be cool to have that happen every once in a while. Uh, so people who wouldn't, oh, you know, they, if they can't travel, they wouldn't have to. So, Lakeisha, oh my gosh, hmm. four months. Thank you so much for being here for four months. Speaking of swaps, you guys should come to the Carolina Aquatic Expo one day. Good excuse to visit John and Lisa. Well, that sounds like a good excuse. I'll have to check it out. I don't know when what that win. is. Yeah. Yeah. We will be next spring, potentially in St. Louis. We're going to... Uh, that's do right. something in St. Louis, so uh, we'll be there. I I I spoke at the Pasco 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 uh, Club in Florida. That was a lot of fun. That was a really good club. If you guys are in Florida, like around the I guess it'd be like Tampa Bayish area, but it's a little bit further um, 
East, that's one you, you need to check out. That that club has got it. They do it right. They really do. Those 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 after the meeting auctions are huge. There are so many bags. I was like, are you guys doing like a like a full on auction? They're like, no, this is every meeting. It's it's cool. Elizabeth, thank you for being a member of the last 13 months. Just got here. Hi, everyone. I think my green severum has a oh, hole in the head disease. First treatment today, mm. advice. All right, so you're treating already. Uh, water. Make sure the water is really, really, really clean, meaning you're definitely 20 parts per million less or less on the nitrates. Uh, make sure you've got good flow. And then, yeah, just keep the treatments up. Keep an eye on the fish. If it gets worse, that that's a, that's something where you could potentially, if you've got the, the tank to do it, if it's a full-grown severum, you might need like a 20-gallon hospital tank, and then you could treat it there. It might be a little bit easier than trying to treat a larger tank. But, yeah, I hope, hopefully it, 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 it does okay. All right, let's see here. Jerry says, I wish, I wish I could meet you guys one day. Hey, man. One day, I hope so too. Yeah. We got Orlando, we got Dallas, we got Chicago, we got the swaps. Hopefully, uh, someday we'll cross paths. That'd be pretty cool. Lucas says the Quad City fish swap isn't too far from you. Uh, yes, that is true. Uh, we have been meaning to be a part of that. I don't know. There's one in November. And by the way, that is an outstanding swap from everything I've heard. I've never been there. It's, it's big and it has grown considerably. And I've heard nothing but good things about the quad city swap so i am absolutely interested at some point i think we missed the window for november I'll, I'll double check but i'm pretty sure we have but certainly i think they've got a couple swaps in the spring and i'd love to be part of that because i've heard lots of like i said lots of good stuff lynn says gotta back off on buying fish after october i have a french bulldog coming from poland picking her up oh my at goodness. o'hare on 11 16. yep cool Keep the Danes in line. That's cool. Congratulations. That'll be oh, exciting. Puppy. Absolutely. Uh, Lynn also says Quad City. Yeah, Quad City's good. Any swaps near Atlanta? I don't know. If anybody lives <laughs> in uh, near Atlanta, pipe in. Say, oh, yeah, there's this really cool club. And, again, it's not even just the swaps. It's also the club auctions. That That is the place where you save. By, let me give you some examples. Can I, can I just give you some examples of at least around us and the GCCA green water swaps, like some memorable deals that I got. And you've probably gotten some too, I would imagine. <laughs> I remember one time buying 12 Crebenzas that were about an inch and a half for a dollar. Mm. And they were, I put them in a 75 and they were amazing. I bought 12 Midas cichlids for a dollar that were about this big. That was pretty cool. I one time at a swap, no joke, I got 11, I think it was 11 or 12 angelfish, about maybe the size of a nickel for two bucks. Wow. And that was those were the ones I put in a 75, and this is before YouTube. A lot of them, like over half of them were veil tail. They were amazing. It is very common because what happens is people breed fish. For the breeder awards points, usually the fish are gonna be, are gonna be very, very small, like juveniles. The thing with that is you just have to have patience. Uh, there are fish where you can get in a group of six, eight, ten of them. They'll just chuck them in a bag. Yeah, they're going to be less than an inch, but wait three, four, five months until they grow up. And by the way, when they grow up together, sometimes they get along a lot better. And then you've got some males that are showing insane color that if you were to go to a pet store and buy a fish like that just individually, you might spend 30 or 40 bucks for one fish. And sometimes you can get these fish for just a few dollars. So that's pretty cool. Uh, Noelle finished out her tank. She had chilies and pygmies. Oh. She made her selection of pumpkin shrimp. Nice. That's a cool combination. I like Heck that. Yeah. That's really cool. That's awesome. That's really great. And yep. I think that's what you could find, too. So win-win, especially in the autumn season. <laughs> Jimmy P says, what a coincidence, Jason. I have never gotten fish deals like that. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I bet you have. Yeah. <laughs> Up girl Atlanta has the Atlanta Area Aquarium Association. It's the club and does swaps and auctions. That's the other. Oh, I didn't even mention that. Here's here's a pro tip for you. If you've got a club that has an auction, right? Like maybe they do an auction two, three times a year. The auctions will typically last all day. So maybe they're like on a Sunday and they start at 10 a.m. and they go until the fish are sold. For the larger auctions, when we were part of them, that meant four or five o'clock in the afternoon. Early on in those auctions, a lot of money's being thrown around. 
and a lot of the fish are going for pretty good prices as a seller, but not again, you're still saving a ton of money. As a buyer, what you do is you have patience, you set aside the day, and usually by about one or certainly two o'clock in the afternoon, a lot of the people who really wanted certain fish have gotten their fish, they've run out of money, they leave. Now you're around for the last 50 bags of fish and there's not as many people bidding or there's already been four or five bags of those fish that have been purchased and now there aren't a whole lot of buyers left, you can start picking up absolutely ridiculous deals. I mean, as a seller, it stinks because I'll give you an example. I remember bringing in bags of Cyprochroma Sleptosoma. It's a Lake Tanganyikan fish that is absolutely gorgeous. These were full grown fish at a pet store. You can certainly, at least around our area, expect to pay $30 to $40 per fish. Now, I knew that that wasn't going to happen at a swap, but I was hoping that if there were six in a bag, I would get eight to ten dollars per fish. All right, that seemed pretty reasonable. And early in the auction, that was happening. Well, one one or two of the bags didn't actually make it to the auction table until later in the afternoon. Both of those bags went for like five bucks a piece. Six, nearly full grown, Cyprochromus leptosoma, whole bag, five bucks. That's the kind of stuff that happens at an auction. If you can be patient and stick it out, especially in the afternoon, you will just be like double fist in bags of fish, trying to find out. You got to bring a big old cooler, like bring or a tote and just bring be like it. boom, boom, boom. And you can buy an incredible amount of fish and walk out of them like, how much money did you spend? I spent like 50 bucks and I've got like 13 bags of fish here. So, oh yeah, the auctions can be a really, really, really great time to to save serious money, like for serious. Okay, we're gonna take some questions. By the way, if you want your question answered or you want us to see it a little bit easier, put the at primetime aquatics, type that out and then write your question in. Highlights it in orange for us and it makes it a little bit easier for us to see. So for instance, like Gabriel said, what are your thoughts on the 30, 30 long, uh, oh, sorry, 30, oh, it's on, it's 30 long, 23 inches high, 12 inches deep. So that is the- 33? That's the 33 long. Uh, no, because 33 longs are 48 inches and not nearly as high. So 30 inches long, 23 inches tall, 12 inches, what, length times width, height, depth? All right, I'm, I'm kind of have a, so normally it's length times width times height. So usually it's 30 inches long, 23 inches wide, and 12 inches deep. If that's the case, it's kind of cubish. I like it. Sounds like it'd be a cool tank. Something Certainly something fun to aquascape, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, do like a cube Island thing scape, with, yeah, with something in the center, if that's the actual dimensions. Unless you hose it up. Well, I would hose it up. I, I don't know how to aquascape. You'd have a pile of rocks in the no, center. I that's mean how the I'd dimensions, run. silly. Well, yeah, unless I mess up the dimensions, that's for sure. Uh, David says, I've never been to an auction. Trust me. Th this is a This is a thing where if you've got one in your state or in a state that's less than a few hours drive and you're not used to going to them, I promise you, it it, it, it could very well be worth it where you're like, yeah, I had to spend an entire Sunday at this auction and I wasted a bunch of gas, but I spent very little money and got so many fish and I just basically filled up like four tanks worth of fish. So it can happen. Uh, Tom says, can I mix electric blue cara, redhead tapahos and rusty cichlids in a 90? So a lot of purists are gonna they're gonna say, oh my gosh, the rusty cichlids, that's an African cichlid, and the redhead topos and the blue cars, they're not, and so you're not supposed to mix them. In our fish room, all of our water parameters are exactly the same. So if you've got a tank that's got geophagus in it, and then a tank right next to it's got African cichlids, the water parameters are the same. So I don't necessarily consider that to be a hugely valid argument unless the water parameters are so not conducive to the growth. Like if you had a pH of six and a half and a water hardness in the low single digits that don't do the rusty cichlids. But if you're, if the water parameters are conducive to the, all their growth, the electric blue acara and the redhead tapahos in a 90, yes. Like that, I don't think that's gonna be a problem at all. The rusties, you'd have to, you'd really have to kind of see how it goes. The only, the other issue there potentially is diet. Uh, to me, that's the bigger stumbling block when you're trying to keep a mix like that because the rusties don't, like a ton of protein. So, you know, if you chuck some blood worms in there, the electric blue car are going to go crazy. The redheads are going to go crazy. The rusties will go crazy too. And then they could blow it out. 
So the bigger concern there is can you find a diet that is not super high in protein, but yet high enough in protein that the electric blue car and the red he redheads are going to be enjoying it? For that reason, sometimes I, or not sometimes, I, I don't, and the Rusty's too, they're Imbuna. So I, I definitely don't mix my Imbuna with, like if you look around our fishing, that's the one thing I don't do is I don't mix Imbuna with my South and Central Americans just because that diet component is is so different. If it was a peacock cichlid that's chilled out maybe, but uh, I might just go with the redhead tapahos and the electric blue acara more for diet than even the water parameters. What say you? All right, Brandy says, I bought Marineland Portrait Tank for a beta and uh, let's see what kind of substrate I'm so overwhelmed in choosing. Bought Fluval Bio Substrate going in my environmental science classroom. Cool. Well, the um, the the Fluval Bio Substrate. I'm assuming then you you have live plants, so that would be good. Uh, I would personally just because those those substrates tend to be very kind of light, and they'll pop up, and your plants may not want to stay down. I personally like to maybe put a small layer of that even in the back where you're going to be planting and then cover it, cap it with something like sand, which you can also get at the big box stores. I like PetSmart's black uh, topsin sand, but any color sand, whatever look you're going for it, then you're kind of like a win-win. You got some nutrients and stuff in the, in the bottom and cap it with some pretty sand and there you go. But yes, it can be very overwhelming choosing substrate. I would just look at the, uh, the color. What yep. kind of color you're looking for? And, and we've done videos. You know, go mm -hmm. back and look at some of the substrate videos that we've done. I think we have an entire playlist that's just based on aquarium substrate. I had a really old video I did where I went through gravel versus sand versus specialty substrate. We've done videos on sand versus gravel and different color sands and different brands. Those videos, by the time you get done with them, should give you some some direction. I wouldn't overly stress about the substrate. Mm -hmm. For the most part, sand tends to work better with more fish right so there's a lot it's very rare that you see a fish was like oh they don't do well on sand it is sometimes possible to have fish that maybe aren't really good with gravel so but yeah check out those videos that's that that you know it'll probably all those videos combined might might take you an hour but it's pretty much an exhaustive list sean thank you so much for the super chat i have a question probably won't work just going to ask anyway would yellow labs and angel fish work probably not long term and again one is the diet like we talked about earlier your angel fish would love them some blood worms uh, they at first would be able to keep up with the yellow labs in terms of eating as angel fish get larger two things are going to happen one those long fins will sometimes be a target for the yellow labs and yellow labs aren't particularly aggressive and i'm sure people have kept them together before but there's a couple things going on there one Sometimes people like to keep angelfish in a planted tank because it looks really nice. That's not possible with your yellow labs. For the most part, they eat a lot of the different types of plants. Two, again, the diet differences where the yellow labs would prefer more vegetable matter in their diet compared to high proteins. The third thing to consider is activity level. Larger angelfish actually tend to be fairly chilled out where even large yellow labs are like pop, 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 they're going all over the place. And so that might stress your, your angels out quite a bit. So, And if there's ever an aggression problem, it, it, the yellow labs are absolutely going to destroy those angels, which could be a problem twofold. One, if the angels start to breed and they want to protect an area, that is going to be a, a bad thing because those yellow labs are not going to allow them to commandeer any place in the tank and they, they're not going to care if the angelfish are protecting eggs or or they're starting to find a breeding area because the difference between the two is the yellow labs when they breed they'll dig out a little pit they'll do their little spinny thing and they'll you know the female will release the eggs and all that stuff and male will fertilize and the female picks it back up in her mouth but then they're really not territorial after that because the female with the eggs in her mouth will just kind of go off to the side and won't eat and won't be part of anything. But when the angelfish start to breed, they're going to breed on a structure. And now they're going to try to protect that structure. And that could be a big problem because, like I said, the yellow labs are going to be like, yeah, this is, this is ours. You're not protecting jack squat. And that could cause terrible fights. Um, and on the, the substrate question, Brandy, typically you put the, like the fluval, 
uh, any kind of substrate like that, usually you put that on the bottom. That's the bottom layer, especially if you're trying to build up, if you're trying to do like a slope, that's the bottom layer. And then you cap it with either sand or gravel. If you wanted to use gravel, totally use gravel. That's fine. Yeah, I would just put the gravel on the top. Barksdale Goldens, I am going to an auction this weekend. First time going. I hope you have a great time. Yeah, good I luck. There's a ton of cool fish. Like I said, be patient. Be the one that's there at 2 o'clock in the afternoon if you can be, especially if you're going at this time of the year and all of a sudden everybody's favorite football team is playing at like 3 in the afternoon. That place is going to clear out and you are going to clean up. Pistachio, what's better filtration to use on a 275-gallon canister filters? Currently have three FX6s on it or a sump. I go sump on a tank that large. I So uh, full disclosure, I don't like canister filters. And if you do, that's cool. I don't like them because of who I am as a person. I just, <laughs> I just don't like them. Okay, so here's the deal. That's pretty convincing, right? Does it seem amazing. like I was gonna cry about canister filters? No. I know I hate cleaning filters, which is a big reason why when you look around our fish room, we've got sponge filters and hang on backs. I don't even like to clean the small internal canister filters. I find that to be a pain. <laughs> All I wanna do when I go to a filter is grab the media out of the back of a hang on back, stick new media in, stick new filter floss in. If it's a sponge filter, I just wanna pop the top off, take it to the sink, give it a little squeezy, right back in it goes. It takes two seconds. That can't be done with a canister filter, especially those big FX6s you're running, which is, by the way, you've done an appropriate thing. So if I had to take that size, I wouldn't be running hang on backs. I would be doing what you're suggesting. But I know me, and I know I would despise with every fiber of my being cleaning, popping, turning off that canister filter, popping that stupid thing open, breaking the seal, cleaning all that stuff out, getting the whole thing to run again, and now I have to do that times three. I would hate that with everything in me. The sump, on the other hand, obviously you got to, you know, most of the time you're doing an overflow drill in the tank, but the sump is actually really easy to maintain. And there's tons of benefits that you're getting that you're not getting from a canister filter. So one, 275 gallon tank, maybe what are you running? Like a 55 gallon, 75 gallon sump? You put a filter sock on there, that might be the only thing you're actually cleaning. You know, So you go filter sock, and then maybe you've got some filter floss where the water comes in, then you've got some biomedia under that, then you've got another compartment where maybe you're doing some pothos, you got a light down there, or some aquatic plants that are sucking nitrates out, something you cannot do with a canister filter, especially important if you've got a cichlid tank and like, oh, they'll eat plants. Who cares? I'll put my plants or my pothos in the sump with a light. You could put, I, I, I did a, a fish room tour. If you ever wanna see a really cool sump system, it's a really old video, it's called Tim's Fish Room. The first one I did of his fish room He's got a really a sump that he built that was fairly elaborate. He's got a UV light sterilizer uh, going in line with that. They're, they just really are easy to maintain. And oh, by the way, if you wanted to, you could aerate that water a little bit easier. And then when the water is returning back to the tank, the aeration is happening. Maybe you've got a bubbler, you know, a, a sponge, not a sponge filter, a uh, what you would call it, an air stone down there. And so you're getting a little bit of oxygenation there. You could cycle sponge filters down there if you wanted to for quarantine tanks. It's just, yeah, there would be apps. If I had a big tank, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind it would be a sump. I would not mess with canisters at all because of my hangups as a human being and a fish keeper. What say you? What, do you have anything to talk about? Any that's things that you saw? Good. Good. That's, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, Lakeisha, thank you so much for the super chat. I'm considering redoing my fish corner. I like that. You Fun. Fish corner. Currently, I keep and breed South African dwarf cichlids, shrimp, rice fish. That's a really cool combo. Uh, what tank sizes would you recommend to optimize the function? I have 20 plus tanks in my living room. <laughs> I like it. Wow. That doesn't sound necessarily like a fish corner. It's becoming, I know you're calling it a fish corner because probably if there's somebody else in the home, they maybe don't want an entire fish room. <laughs> You're there. It's You've got a, a fish room. It's just a corner that's expanded out halfway across the room. It's still derived from a corner. It's impressive. Uh, so let's see. You're doing. So you're doing small South Americans. So maybe like your pistos, your rams. Maybe you could throw some curbenzis in there from West Africa. Shrimp, rice, fish. It's all small stuff. Uh, if I'm optimizing, I don't need anything larger than a 20 gallon long. And I would do 20 gallon longs. I wouldn't do 20 highs. 
uh, the shrimp, the rice fish, and you don't, rice fish, you can use a 10 gallon. Shrimp, you can do a 10 gallon as well. But I just, if you wanna do something uniform, I would just run 20 gallon longs. The nice thing about them is you can easily go three high, right? So if you're optimizing and wanna run an air system, you, you, you triple stack your 20 gallon longs. You know, you could either build the stands if you want to, if you don't feel like building the stands. There's a lot of stands like the ones that we reviewed from Lowe's that will easily hold three 20 gallon longs. One of them would be close to the floor. That might not be the, I wouldn't. the, the best thing to do unless you've got a floor drain, mm -hmm. but it, yeah, 20 longs is what I would do all day. And now if you got into anything bigger, you might want some 40 breeders. You know, that was one of the things when we, when we did the fish room, I wanted, I could have done a lot of really large tanks, but I knew I wanted to keep lots of different types of fish. And sometimes fish don't always go together. I knew I wanted to breed certain types of fish. And so when you look at our fish room, especially the side with the sink, you know, with the multis in the center, it was 20 logs along one side. It was 40 breeders along the other. The 50 gallon low boy, there's just standard 20s under that. And then the other wall had larger tanks just for fun, the 75s and 125s. But I knew I wanted primarily 20 logs and 40 breeders. I think they're extremely uh, versatile. Now they got the 60 breeder. We talked about that last week or the week before. That's a great tank as well. Easy to double stack those and not have to have really super long arms. And you don't, necess you don't necessarily have to be on like a full ladder either to clean the top 60 at that point. So that's what I would do. That's how I'd roll with it. What say you? Have anything that had... stands out in the land of small scape sort of questions? Um, my, uh, oh, Cyclops767 uh, says, I want to keep shrimp so bad. My pH is uh, 6 to 6.2. <sighs> You're perfect. You don't just don't do the neo caridina, do the caridina, do the Taiwan yeah. bees. Go go oh, to I love Flip Taiwan. Aquatics. They've got all the shrimp water parameters there. He's done a billion and a half videos on shrimp. Your your water parameters are in good shape. You might have to remineralize with some GH, but you know, he's got a lot of videos. But our problem is because our pH is so high at around an eight or an eight point two, the neo caridina do fine, but we'd have to use RO water to bring the water hardness down and our pH down to do the Caridina and the Taiwan Bs and the Reallys and that kind of stuff. But you've got you've got some ability there with your water parameters. So I am not an expert on remineralizing, otherwise I'd give you more information, but Flip is. And so Rob, can he's got videos out there on how to do it. Bonsai, thank you so much for the jumping man. Appreciate the super chat, thank you. I didn't see a question, but if it winds up, you can kind of keep a lookout uh, for it. Thank you very much. Lakeisha says, I wish I could post pics with Super Chats. I mm. wish that. Why isn't that a thing? Oh, my gosh. Hold on. I got to go turn on the backup light. Uh, wait, maybe you can see my shirt glowing now. No, you can't. No? All right. So okay. that light went out. Oh, my gosh. I'm back. We're back. Oh, that one? Yeah. No. So it's going to be a little bit. It's going to be a different vibe now because the backup mm. light is here. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, I, I don't, that YouTube, if you're ever listening, not <laughs> that you ever listen to a random live stream about fish, but I think that would be really cool. That would be an awesome idea that people be able to post pictures and share stuff and just build community. Oh, here it is. Bonsai Science. I tore out my canisters this week uh, for your same feelings. I went with <laughs> two hang on backs on my 47 gallon. Yeah. Hashtag hate canisters. Uh, yeah. Canisters Club. Oh yeah, that for me personally, I would run hang on backs all the way up to probably at least a hundred and eighty gallon tank. I could see myself running three probably either Seachem one tens or the big marine land pro three seventy, what are they four four fifties, uh, Emperor four fifties, and I would just run three of them before I would ever run a single canister or any canister filters. Once you get above the 180, for me, that's when I would start considering a, a drill tank and a sump. But And it, by the way, it's okay. If you like canister filters, totally cool. I understand that it's a great way to have a lot of media, get a lot of flow, and also hide the filtration. So I get all that. I really do. It's cool. So I just, I know me. I'm too lazy to to do those cleaning things. Can't do it, man. All right, uh, Lisa says, we have soft water with high pH out of the sink and our angels are suffering. We remove the rocks, but still can't seem to get the tank below 7.8. What can we do to help with the soft water high pH? 
Okay, so that's actually not a bad position to be in. So soft water with a high pH. One, all right, so let's think this through. So I don't know how high your pH is normally. You said seven, eight. Our pH is an eight to an 8.2. We keep angels all the time. They tend to live a very long and healthy, happy life. So, and, and by the way, our water is 10 on the GH and the cage. So angels can live and live for a long time. I mean, I've had some angels that were, the bodies were easily the palm of my hand and a foot from the top, veil tails from the top of their top fin to the bottom of their anal fin. So they can live and, and live a long time in water that's got harder water with a higher pH. You're saying seven, eight, but your water's soft. Now, we have to identify what that means. The most important water hardness parameter when it comes to pH is KH. So if your KH is low, you're actually in pretty good shape because at that point, you could start adding larger pieces of driftwood and those organics as they're released will most likely, because there's not a lot of KH there, will overcome that. You've got peat that you could add to filters. If you're gonna do this, I would do this slowly. You don't wanna shock the fish and all of a sudden go from a seven, eight down to a six and a half or something like that, which could very well happen. You could look at your water change schedule. Uh, those nitrates as they build up will, will um, certainly potentially lower pH. Uh, organics, botanicals, the catapa leaves, the choya wood, that can all potentially uh, work as well. Obviously, you've got the RO water that you can do, but the RO water is going to make your water even softer, but that would also lower KH. So those are all things, things that you could potentially do. The other thing is uh, some of like the, uh, what's the substrate that people use and it lowers? Is it flu stratum or is it eco-complete? One of those as a substrate will will buffer pH on the lower side. I'm not entirely I sure. I think I'm not say. it's flu wall stratum. I, don't quote me on this. And again, Rob from Flip Aquatics, I know he uses, I thought it was flu wall stratum to keep his pH buffered in the upper sixes, somewhere around there. So, But again, any water parameter changes that you make, you got to do it slow because you don't want to shock those fish. A change from 7, 8 to 6, 8 is a big change. Dustin, thank you so much for the super chat. Feeding fish one or two versus two times a day. That is a debate. Um, I could, I'll tell you what we do. There are people I know who feed certain fish only three times a week. We feed all of our tanks twice a day. They tend to be smaller feedings, right? So I'm not like just throwing whole handfuls of food. Well, some tanks I am <laughs> heavily stocked, but uh, very you know small meals, which means yeah everybody's getting fed, but they're not like totally like oh man that was like Thanksgiving dinner twice a day. Uh, the reason I do that is I have found over time two things happen when I feed twice a day, and especially because I feed my baby Brian twice a day as well. One, the fish that are typically aggressive don't, they're not as aggressive in our fish room when they're well fed. It's one of the reasons why when you look around our fish room, you see all of our fish room tours, you see the fish tanks right behind us every week when we're shooting videos, there's not a ton of aggression there. And I think one of the main, there's a couple things that can cause, a few things that cause aggression, not enough space, protecting structure, um, warm temperatures, warmer water. You know, we're starting to get into like the 78 above, 80, 82, some fish get a little bit more metabolically active and angry, and then being hungry. So feeding them twice a day has made our aggressive fish less aggressive and it's also increased fish breeding quite a bit because the smaller fish the juveniles they don't have the ability to store you know or eat a lot of food at once so we feed smaller meals twice a day and i think that's helped quite a bit so i'm a two day a per two times per day feeding person yes you are yeah I'm not saying it's wrong to do once a day i'm not saying it's wrong to skip a day here and there uh, because fish don't necessarily need to be fed that often it's just i found that there's a lot of benefits to it marley what size does a fish fry have to be before it's put with adults i have mollies um i don't ever remove my molly fry and they survive they go crazy uh that's the reason why i've got purple spot gobies in there now in our 50 gallon tank because i was just getting overrun with mollies and the purple spot gobies are like mm -mm -mm. this is pretty good uh but even still, I still have molly fry survive. It's more about do you have space at the top for them to hide, like hornwort or something that, you know, floating plants, hornwort, water sprite, water wisteria where it's floating, uh, that kind of stuff. Guppy grass will help. 
But if you're removing them, that's that's totally fine too. A lot of people do that. I would say usually by about three quarters of an inch, they should be relatively safe. Try it out. Uh, you know, if they're still there, if they're still there tomorrow, you know, yeah, he was right, three quarters of an inch. If they go missing, like that dude, he done me wrong. Now I've got no molly fry left, but usually around three quarters of an inch, they're going to leave them alone. I would add them with the lights off too, just so that they're not over curious and chasing them around. It tends to help a little bit. Julio says, I love my local fish store. That could be a bumper sticker. I love my local fish store. That's good. We've got a good one here, Trump Aquatics. We did a fish room tour of them or a fish store tour of them and probably last year at this point. Uh, Dennis has done a lot of work with that store. It was um, in various states of disrepair before he took it over and he's done so much and it's it's really cool to see. Trump Aquatics, if you're ever in western suburbs of Chicago. And we still need to make it to Fish Planet. Fish Planet, I cannot believe we live here and we've never gone there because I hear nothing but good things about them. I can't speak to them. So embarrassed. Uh, and I, I am too. I, we get people that come. I think John was there. John and Lisa, when they came in, like, hey, we're at Fish Planet. I'm like, cool. I've never been there. Even they, oh my gosh. So embarrassed. It's it's just because they're in the northern suburbs and we're in the western suburbs and there's you just can't get there from here. So it makes it a little bit harder uh, to get up there, but we have to go because they really have everything I've heard. People just, they really like the place. It can't be more than a day's journey by horse and carriage. You know what I mean? Okay. It's there, just over. You have no excuse. It's just above Give 15 me miles planet. as the crow flies. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Andy Rink, Flip uses Brightwell. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Andy. That's Brightwell. right. Okay. It, Andy said he is going to Aquashell. Oh, good. What, That's cool. What? Are you going to have a booth there, or are you just hanging out? Yeah. Mr. Rink. All right, let me see here. I just lost the question. Flood City, mystery snail question. Will established colony last six months or so by, uh, or so lay eggs like crazy, but nothing hatches, either fall off the glass onto the water or just never hatch? Uh, let's see here. Will established colony. So... I don't who put the video out. I don't remember who it was. Was it Lab Snails back in the day or Life with Pets? One of them, they breed a lot. When I do mystery snails, it's just they lay them on the top of the polycarbonate. If they stay moist enough, they hatch. Got a bunch of them. If they dry it out, I never did anything special. But one of them, either Lab Snails or Life with Pets, did a video. I think it was one of those two. What is it? And I'll tell you. They did a, a video on a breeding, a Tupperware breeding container that floats in the tank with some wet paper towels. And they would put the clutch of eggs in that and then the put the top on. I think they poked some holes in it. And they, she has lab snails. Yeah, they got pretty much 100% hatch rate. So you could try that. It would definitely fish eggs <laughs> before I could pull them oh, out. What's the best way to transfer eggs to another tank? Okay, well it's a problem I've dealt with. So I, I mean, I kind of laugh, but I know what you're going through. All the times I've bred geophagus, like I, I would notice it on my way, like to feed the fish right before work. I'm like, I don't have time to remove these eggs. I'll get them when I get home and they're all gone. And that happened to me dozens of, I'm not gentle with the eggs and maybe I should be, but I, I can't speak to angelfish. I've only bred them a couple times and not on purpose. But with the ge geophagus eggs, same thing. I would literally take a butter knife, would scrape the eggs off, suck them up with a turkey baster, and then squirt them into an egg tumbler. I got ridiculously good uh, hatch rates doing that. And if you if you saw it and you're like, seriously, you're just scraping these things off.